I have good news. And the good news is that we have a new steak offering. The Delmonico is unique. It looks like a ribeye, but watch what happens when I flip this little steak over. It turns into something other than a ribeye. And it's because this is the beginning of the chuck roast. So at the very end of the ribeye roast on the cow, if you move forward, you get into the chuck roast country. And the transition zone between the end of the ribeye and the beginning of the chuck is this little gem right here. And what it brings to the table is unprecedented flavor. And also more variance in muscle groups. So you get a greater cut diversity in flavor and textural selections. So now um, I'm gonna welcome you <laughs> into our kitchen again. And I'm gonna show you how I pan fry in this well-seasoned cast iron pan um, the Delmonico King Steak. Anyway, so I got a little bit of butter and we just use a re little bit of uh, regular salted butter for this. Get the pan kind of hot. We're running at a four on our scale here and get ready to place Delmonico Steak into pan. And you can see we got just a little bit of sizzle, not a lot. I don't want to go too fast here. I, know, I never cook these steaks on high because otherwise I'll never get beyond just raw pink purple in the middle. I like to push them into a pink band in the middle instead of just raw purple. I just lay the pepper on pretty thick here. I do like pepper. Then I take a little bit of Redmond sea salt. So now what I do is I pat that in. So now I'm going to flip and to do that I just work it off gently so I don't leave any material down on the pan, any flesh material for my steak. And now I'm going to do the same thing on this side. I do a little bit of pepper and um, then I put a little sea salt on that side. So now with cast iron you can do this. I just do this because what this does is gets the butter under the steak so you don't have stickiness and where you have ripping and tearing going on, okay? So this is turn number two and now some chefs and steak aficionados are freaking out because they're like, he turned it more than one time. And I think that allows too much heat to penetrate the steak by keeping it only on one side. Uh, this way I'm actually cooling each side of the steak as I flip and it allows for slower heat penetration while I'm building a highly caramelized crust. Now here you can even see in the pan already why I'm losing a little bit of ribeye shape already and this is what the uh, Delmonico will do because it's a little more fragmented because it's moving into the chuck so you have this kind of separation of church and steak as the uh, steak is in the pan. And I don't think it's a bad thing. To me, it's like a smorgasbord on the plate when we're finally done. Now I'm going to turn my burner off because I want to keep um, building crust slowly without burning, without too much heat penetration to the middle of the steak. Now what I do is I just put this over it. And this is important because um, what a lot of people will do at this point is <laughs> they, um, they'll actually cover the steak with a lid. And that's the biggest mistake you could ever make because now you're moving into the boiled meat world. Uh, boiled meat to me is always nasty. And the reason boiled meat is nasty to me is because the steak can't caramelize if there's water in there. And if you don't have some kind of highly breathable surface over the steak and over your pan, then I'll end up with water down in my pan if it's just a lid. Okay, so now here we go. We've done three turns now. One, two, three, four, five, six. A total of six flips. So we're gonna start doing the finger test now. We're gonna start palpating. See how gelatinous that is underneath. This chuck side is still is gonna start firming up first. And it's because the fibers on this side start running longitudinally. And I'll show you why later as we cut this up to eat, why that's actually a cool thing. I also do this, I just spin. You know, I'm, my, my pan is not warm enough that this stuff is starting to burn. Okay, that's important because otherwise you're just picking up, you know, black and charcoal trash. You don't ever want that kind of level of heat in your pan. 
you want enough to get caramelization, but you don't want enough to cause charcoal and blackening on your steak. Okay, let's see what's happening. Ooh, oh, starting to firm a little bit. Here we are. Oh, see, that's getting the right patina. You want the patina. You don't want to go to black, but you want parts of it to be dark brown, most of it to be golden brown. That indicates flavor formation through caramelization. But you can see we've got some very nice color development in this fat. It's like, um, they're probably polyphenols, like uh, beta, beta carotene in there uh, from the grass. And that's why we got kind of this kind of orangey fat that's got nice color that you won't see in a grain-fed steak. Oh, we're getting close here. Now I'm starting to reach the uh, texture of my, uh, my nose. Okay, so this is the way I do it. But if it's like this, uh, you know, palpating my cheek, pretty gelatinous underneath, that means it's probably still too rare. Um, if it's like the firmness of the tip of my nose, you know, it's got that little bounce factor to it, that's getting really close, and that's exactly what's happening with the steak right now. If I get the, um, the tenseness and the uh, shallow depth in palpation of my chin, I know I've probably gone too far. And this is not to be considered for something that you would eat the steak immediately. These tests are all contingent upon the fact that you're going to let it lay for about two and a half minutes. The feel thing occurs after doing this with hundreds and hundreds of steaks a year. And um, you develop this feel for this after a while. And it's not something you can just walk into and say, oh, I got it. So the way to learn it is just to have an interior probing um, thermometer with a digital read cable so you can actually compare interior temperatures. So I like to pull a steak off with an interior temperature, say in the eye portion of the steak, this is the ribeye portion of the ribeye section here, this round area, that's the eye, it's shaped like an eye, so it's easy to remember. Anyway, that's the interior, and that's where I'm gonna really do my probing because it's the heart of the steak. And here, I got a little bit of gelatinous feel on that side yet, so I'm gonna keep going for a little long. This side, I'm done. So by flipping it, I've reduced temperature, exposure on this side of the steak. This is allowed now to begin at least being stable or cooling. Okay, I think we're there. Okay, and I say two and a half minutes. I would say two and a half to three minutes is okay. Um, three minutes and past, I'm getting into steak cooling. I like to eat a hot steak. So we got good pink texture. It's even all the way through. I don't really like a pink flame through the middle. I like uh, consistency and no gradients. So if you do want the purple band indicating, you know, fairly raw meat, but that's just been barely heated up, I would say pull it off at like around 128 instead of 133. This steak came off at around 133 in the terms of the eye temperature after a two and a half minute rest. This section can be really ropey and I'll show you what, what I mean by ropey. You can see the grain now is running longitudinal associated with my cut. As a result, it'll feel like rope in your mouth. So I always try to avoid that by just looking at the grain. You can see it very clearly, that caramelized grain running through. And I'll just cut a little tiny medallion off that. The eye, you can cut any way you want. That's that center eye section that's shaped like an eye, remember? And it's also known for its tenderness and uniformity. As a result, you can cut that any way you want. Now we have the uh, multifidus dorsi right here. And this is also a very tender cut. It has a whole different flavor. There's quite a bit of marble associated with this cut. And it's gonna eat very well. Um, if you cut it right across the short direction of the cut instead of a long, long way. Then there's one more muscle group here that we're going to run into. And it's the spinalis dorsi, which is right here. And you can see it got kind of thin on the cut and it got a little overdone, but it's still going to eat tender. Anyway, that's the Delmonico steak. This is from the heart of the ribeye.
and the lungs just miss Dorset.